Welcome to the Sriram Research Festival 2021, a celebration of ideas hosted by the Economic Society Sriram College of Commerce. With the aim of advancing the ideal of research and delivering it to the vast student fraternity of the country, this festival aspires to acknowledge and amplify the drive for unique and authentic research. To conclude day one with a noteworthy session, we're extremely delighted to be joined by Dr. Arvind Panagalia, a distinguished economist and professor of economics at Columbia University. Before we commence, let me take the privilege to give a brief introduction of our speaker to the audience. An acclaimed academic, Sir is a former chief economist of the Asian Development Bank and professor of economics at the University of Maryland. He has also previously worked with the World Bank, IMF, and UNCA, UNCTAD in various capacities. In March 2012, Sir was honored with Padma Bhushan, the highest, the third highest civilian honor bestowed by India in any field. A widely published professor of economics, Sir has written and edited more than 15 books. His books, India, it, the Emerging Giant, was listed as a top pick of 2008 by The Economist and Times magazines. His more recent book, Why Growth Matters, co-authored with Professor Jagdish Bhagwati, won the coveted Achilles Prize for Excellence in Economic Writing and was listed as the best book of the year by the Financial Times. Sir has also served as the Vice Chairman of Niti Ayo from 2015 to 2017. On behalf of the college and everyone present, I, Maithili Sharma, extend a very warm welcome to you, sir. The session will hover around the state of the Indian economy pre and post COVID-19. The economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in India has been largely disruptive. Notably, India has also been had also been witnessing pre-existing risks to India's economic output. However, India's economic recovery has now gained much momentum. Enthused by ebbing of the second wave, fast-paced vaccinations, and enhanced mobility. Without further ado, and to gain insights into the topic under discussion, I'd like to welcome Dr. Panagaria to address the session with his opening remarks. Thank you, Methali. Um, just uh, how I do maybe 20 minutes and then we take Q&A? Yes, sir, that works. Okay. Okay, so good morning to, uh, well, good evening to good night to everybody. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's a morning here. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm coming from New York. So, um, uh, okay. Uh, uh, let me just give you a, a very long overview uh, and uh, then come to the present day. Um, and, and I'll uh, say many things which may seem like assertions uh, uh, simply because uh, I want to put things on the table. Uh, 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 and since there is not enough time to elaborate on each of these things, uh, it is good to at least have them on the table in case you then during Q&A have questions uh, 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 on those issues. Um, so uh, uh, take a very long view of India's economy starting uh, in 1950. Uh, and if uh, our income per capita income in nine, 1950, uh, was let's say 100, uh, you can think of it uh, as 100 rupees per week uh, uh, per person, uh, but I'm just indexing it. So think of it uh, as 100 uh, in uh, 1950. Then uh, uh, around about 2000, 50 years later, uh, this uh, figure had reached about you know, 310. Uh, uh, so, you know, in, in, in 50 years, what we did was to add about 210 rupees uh, uh, to or 210 to the uh, income of per capita income of 100 in 1950. Uh, uh, by 2019, 20, uh, 2019, that figure, uh, this is just pre COVID, uh, that, that figure would be about at 850, right? So, uh, effectively, what we had done in the, uh, you know, we, we added about 210 in, in the first uh, 50 years, uh, uh, but within uh, the following 20 years, we have added uh, about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, what, 540 or so, uh, uh, which, which is, you know, uh, more than twice uh, of what we did in uh, the long period of about 50 years. 
And that is really the difference between, uh, you know, the kinds of policies that we pursued uh, 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 beginning after the independence uh, and the uh, change that came uh, beginning largely in 1991. You can trace it back maybe to 1980s, some of it, but really the, 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 the truly kind of uh, uh, change uh, in, 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 the, in, in the approach, uh, in, in, in the true uh, sense, the, 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 the policy framework itself was, uh, you know, some changes in the 1980s uh, in, in this direction were within the old existing policy framework. Uh, but uh, 1991 was a watershed year when we basically said that we are going to now adopt a new policy framework. Uh, and then the basically all of you probably know that, you know, pre-1991, we were in a very controlled regime, uh, 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 licensing on uh, imports, licensing on investment, uh, uh, nearly autarkic, uh, meaning, you know, very inward looking trade policies, uh, 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 very distorted uh, capital markets, very distorted labor markets, uh, very distorted land markets and all. Uh, in 91, we began to dismantle that, uh, that regime. Uh, and, and that process is still ongoing. Uh, uh, some setbacks, including one today where the farm laws have been withdrawn. Uh, but uh, 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 generally, you know, a move continuously towards uh, uh, giving greater play to markets and that is uh, and also opening up the economy so both uh, of those things have uh, 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 given dividend and it's not you know it often it is confused that uh, somehow growth for growth uh, growth for its own sake growth is not for its own sake growth is to combat poverty uh, and and the, the numbers the evidence is completely unequivocal like you know during years that we have grown rapidly uh, uh, you know, 91 onwards. So, you know, we do these uh, expenditure surveys in every five, six years. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the last one uh, has not been released uh, for good reasons. 80, uh, that, that could have been 17, 18. So last, the latest we have is 11, 12. So you can look at poverty figures in 93, 94, uh, 4, 5, and 11, 12. Those are, you know, well done surveys, completely comparable. Uh, and all, and, and you see, you know, massive decline in poverty, and this decline is not limited to any specific group. You can look at rural poverty, you can look at urban poverty, you can look at poverty of, of the uh, scheduled caste, you can look at poverty of scheduled tribes, you can look at poverty among Hindus, among Muslims, among Jains, among Sikhs, every single group uh, doesn't mean every single individual has been made better off uh, uh, as far as poverty is concerned uh, uh, but uh, certainly taken as a group uh, any well defined group actually uh, shows uh, a very significant decline in poverty less so uh, overall i would say uh, uh, you know among the tribes uh, because they are not so well embedded in the in in the general uh, economic uh, system, uh, or, or, uh, uh, tribes tend to be far more rural uh, than, than the rest of the uh, 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 communities. Uh, and they uh, even uh, within rural, often they, they, they are not in the mainstream of the rural economy. So, but even there actually you see a significant decline in poverty. Uh, I'm not give, going to give you numbers here, you know, I can give you some uh, slides, etc. cetera, but, but I'll refrain from that. Uh, I think, you know, we, uh, uh, given the time frame, uh, I, I would simply put that on the table. Now, last, uh, so pre-COVID, uh, if you take pre-COVID, 17 years I want, I like to take. This is uh, beginning with the year 2003-04. This is the first time, you know, we kick off a growth rate of about 8%. Uh, uh, and, and this comes on the back of uh, a very significant pro-market reforms uh, 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 under first Prime Minister uh, Narsim Marao and then under Prime Minister Talbihari Vajpayee. Uh, uh, some very important major reforms done by Prime Minister Rao. Uh, and then that work was carried forward to, uh, to a much farther distance actually by Prime Minister uh, um, uh, uh, Vajpayee. Uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, Prime Minister Rao in my book kind of gets credit for being very bold, meaning, you know, that, that he was the first one who broke the ice 
uh, and took the uh, very difficult, politically difficult uh, decision to turn to markets uh, and away from the, uh, the control regime. Uh, uh, and uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee gets the credit for actually uh, uh, touching on virtually every area of reform. Uh, not everything brought, brought to conclusions. Uh, some areas were left out, but, but really very, very wide ranging reforms. And that finally actually pro, uh, 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 got the dividend. And 2003, four, we shifted to about 8% growth. And uh, uh, that growth uh, uh, carried forward for a, almost a decade, nine years, I would say, from three, four to 11, 12 you see a growth rate of about 8.1% on average. Uh, uh, and, and that's, you know, uh, uh, and that has continued, you know, if, uh, 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 given the current kind of pessimistic uh, uh, mood because of COVID, uh, we think that somehow, you know, things have gone completely out of control and so forth. Uh, uh, and if you were to read, uh, as I do the Economist magazine here, uh, it calls the 2010s as the lost, lost decade. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, of course, Economist doesn't uh, check its numbers. Uh, uh, it used to do good fact checking, but it seems to have abandoned all that. Uh, most of uh, the, the, the media in, 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 uh, in, in the Western world, uh, including the Financial Times, New York Times, et cetera, Washington Post have all abandoned the facts and, and it, it has become all about assertions. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that 2010s actually also, uh, uh, until the end of the, uh, until the COVID hit. So if you take the decade that precedes uh, uh, end of March, 2020, right? That's the dividing months uh, uh, between COVID and non-COVID uh, period. If you take that whole decade, uh, average growth rate was 7%. So if we take, you know, the full, period of these 17 years from 2000, uh, 2003, four uh, to 1920, uh, India has grown on average 7.4%, uh, 7.3, 7.4. Now, you know, for a democracy, certainly uh, that is unprecedented. There is no other example of a democracy growing on a sustained basis for 17 years at 7.3 or 7.4%. Uh, so that is really the good news. Uh, in a way, the bad news is that, you know, our potential, India's potential is higher. Uh, uh, there is no reason why India should not grow also at about 8 to 10% uh, at, at, uh, for a considerable period, meaning two to three decades, uh, uh, which is uh, what uh, some of the really the miracle economies, as we call them, uh, like uh, South Korea and Taiwan, Singapore, uh, during the six, you know, 60s, 70s and 80s did. Uh, uh, and China later on in the 80s, 90s, and uh, 2000s did. Uh, we also should be able to, you know, do that kind of growth uh, for uh, a, a, at least a couple more decades, I would say, uh, once, once COVID settles. Now, why uh, 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 am I optimistic? And I'll then also point out a little bit on, on uh, uh, what some of the weaknesses of, of our economy are. So first, why I, I, I'm so upbeat actually that once we beat uh, uh, COVID, uh, uh, we would grow uh, for sure uh, somewhere between seven to 8% for the coming couple of decades. Uh, although I think if we do a few more things, we could push it up to nine, 10%. Um, Reforms kind of had been held up uh, after 2004. Uh, there's a 10 year period. Uh, UPA rule, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, reforms came to a standstill. Some few things happened, but broadly speaking, that was a lost decade for me as far as the reforms were concerned. We grew very rapidly, but that was on the back of the reforms that had been done earlier. There's always a big lag, uh, both be you know, between reforms kicking off growth as well as uh, 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 some anti-growth actions uh, uh, translating into uh, its impact uh, and, 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 and some of the impact of what actually was hap happened during UPA2 particularly uh, did reflect itself in, in the setback to growth uh, uh, starting in the 11-12 in, in actually, you know, you, you begin to decline to 11-12 or 6.1%. Then the following two years, it fell below 6%, about 59 
and the average uh, it picked up a little bit more during more the years but still we have not got to our really uh, true potential uh, uh, in particular i think there's a, 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 a lot of reckless lending that happened which left the financial markets very weak and then the modi government itself was also slow to clean up those npas the non performing assets that resulted from uh, that kind of reckless lending uh, as a start, you know during this particularly during the second term of the upa but also part of the first term uh, 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 also some of the you know land acquisition act uh, and environmental clearances getting completely clogged up uh, uh, decision making in the uh, uh, government uh, in the upa government uh, becoming uh, pretty much uh, stand still uh, um, uh, even i would say right to education act the way it was formulated uh, number of things you know the retrospective taxation a lot of mistakes happened and that's that's to some degree contributed uh, but i think we are back on uh, uh, the reform track uh, uh, and and i would point out here let's say about four really really big reforms that have happened uh, in the last 5 years uh, which are mutually reinforcing uh, of growth uh, and that is i think the 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 good news which i think will carry us uh to the 7 to 8% growth uh, and and if we as i said if we do a few more things uh, uh, a bit uh, longer um what are these reforms for the insolvency and bankruptcy code uh this is a reform i've been writing uh, uh, on for more than 15 years if you go back read my india the emerging giant book to, which is uh, 2007 uh, uh you'll see there that uh, uh what what ibc is is exactly what i recommend there that that india needed that kind of law uh gst goods and services tax we all know the long history on that one took a long time very very difficult reform uh, required a uh, constitutional amendment about three or four different laws uh, but finally got done uh, initially some uh, teething pains uh, uh, the gst portal uh, took a little time to uh, to to get to where it needed to get to but it's almost there i mean it's still not 100% there but 90% it's there uh, so very very big reform from a number of perspectives uh, uh, mutually reinforcing uh, third labor law reforms these are also about 90% i think 10% remains but the good news on that is that for the remaining 10% the law gives the power to the states to uh, to make the necessary change Uh, just by uh, a notification they don't even have to pass a law by notif notification they can do it so if some at least a few states do the right thing uh, we are will be there 100% but certainly 90% uh, uh, the labor law reform has happened uh, and finally the knocking down of the corporate profit tax uh, to 17% for many new manufacturing uh, investments and 25.2% for the rest from something like 34 35%. I think uh, that's that's another very very big reform. So all these four mutually reinforcing reforms I think would return us to faster growth also uh, uh, generally what I see uh, you know the numbers are yet not quite uh, uh, fully available but uh, 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 from every whatever is available it it looks like you know the lot of the deal the leveraging that needed to be to happen uh, uh, for uh, the corporations uh, uh, from you know the the state of non performing assets and all has happened uh, similarly for the banks also uh the the uh, uh the the balance sheets are now in much better shape so both corporate balance sheets as well as the bank balance sheets are in much better shape it seems i mean i we had feared that that, that post covid this may actually get worse but it it does not seem to be the case uh, uh, uh so so that also is goes in the very positive direction now what is the uh, uh, uh one or two very important things that that well i would say one extremely important uh, um, area in which we are actually faltering uh, going actually in the reverse and that has to do with trade that's my subject and there uh, unfortunately uh, the import substitution uh, uh, has returned uh, uh, many of the tariffs have been raised uh, that i think is 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 a very worrying development uh, 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 you know 
a very important part of the 91 and post-1991 reforms was actually to liberalize and liberalization of trade. And even during UPA two, UPA one, not two, uh, UPA one until about the year 2007, liberalization had continued and the average tariff had been the, the top tariff rate with some exceptions, you know, auto, textiles, clothing, these are exceptions. They have much higher protection even today. Uh, it has continued, uh, but other than that, you know, the top tariff rate had been brought to 10%, uh, uh, and you know, only 10 or 11% of the tariff rates at the time by 2011 were uh, uh, above 15%. Today, almost 25% of the tariff rates have gone above uh, 15%. Uh, uh, in the meantime, we have also not opened through free trade agreements. Uh, and so, in effect, uh, the economy is today much more inward looking than it was. And, and if you hear the, 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 uh, the uh, pronouncements by a lot of our political leaders, uh, even bureaucrats who sometimes speak, um, you hear that the talk is very protectionist. Uh, uh, I mean, they say it in terms of import substitution and all, uh, but uh, that is one and the same thing. Uh, so that is a bit of a worrying trend, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, there is something that sort of takes away from the four big reforms that I've mentioned, uh, uh, you know, rather than reinforce. Uh, so that's something that requires uh, 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 some, uh, not some, but a very significant kind of uh, uh, return to, I mean, you know, reversal of the protection that has happened and return to the, the uh, process of liberalization. Um, because you know, unless unless you can conquer the global markets, we will not get where we want to get. Uh, uh, it, every single economy uh, that has succeeded, uh, it, uh, you know, here I'm you know setting a high bar for success, like uh, China and uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, etc. Uh, and not you know what we are observing as Vietnam is uh, uh, moving on a relatively kind of uh, not quite there, but it, it, a very similar trajectory uh, 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 that requires courage to, to face to the global economy. At the end of the day, if you cannot compete against the best in the world, then you will remain kind of, you know, uh, in, in the cricket terminology, only uh, 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 the, the county cricket uh, player. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, 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 you got to play test cricket, you got to play international uh, uh, and, uh, T20, uh, if you are going to really produce fantastic players. Uh, and, and the same goes for your uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, unless you are globally uh, competitive, uh, you're not going to do it. India's share in the merchandise exports today is still, is still only 1.7%, which is you know about compared with China's 12 to 13%. So we at least have to get to 4 to 5% uh, to, to succeed. Now, one last point, uh, the structural problem in the Indian economy, uh, and, and then we get to Q&A. Uh, the structural problem of Indian economy has been one of smallness. Uh, our economic units are tiny uh, across the board. Uh, if you look at farms, about half of the farms are less than half hectare in size. And if you look at the average size of these half of these farms, it's a quarter hectare. Nobody can you know, productively uh, farm the land uh, uh, on such small farm, uh, uh, you know, lose of, use of machinery, etc., is very difficult. So that's the farm. But similarly, uh, uh, the the uh, um, size of the farms, our farms are, are the tiniest around. Uh, so you know, you got about forty three. Uh, now actually, well, I, I, I will give you the eighteen nineteen figures. Uh, nineteen twenty have changed a little bit. Uh, but 1820, this is from the, uh, uh, from the periodic labor force survey, PLFS. 42.5% were in agriculture, where productivity is low. Then another 44.5% of the workers were in enterprises with fewer than 20 workers. Now, these are tiny enterprises. And many of them actually uh, are enterprises that we call the own account enterprises, where which hire no not even one worker uh, on uh, uh, on, on uh, one worker at the formal wage uh, uh, at, uh, for for the whole year. So these are mom and pop operations, as as if, if I use the American terminology. Uh, uh, so, but you know, so 
So enterprises with less than 20 workers account for another 44 and a half percent. So together agriculture and these very small enterprises uh, uh, account for uh, 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 some 86 percent of India's workforce. Of the remaining only 10 percent of the workers are in enterprises with 20 workers or more. Now, even 20 workers is not a large enterprise by any stretch of imagination. And you look at the Chinese, so most successful Chinese firms, the hundreds of thousands of workers in a single firm. I mean, that's the kind of scale with which they work. Uh, it, I mean, that's the top end, but you know, uh, more than 50% of their workforce, uh, even in 2005, was already in enterprises with 200 or more workers. Uh, another 25% was in the medium size, which is 50 to 200. Uh, and only 25% was less than, this is in 2005. Whereas ours was, 80, in that year, 84% was in enterprises with uh, uh, 50 or fewer workers. So that smallness actually keeps your average productivity very low. Uh, uh, and, and that's reflected pretty much in the income levels and the uh, uh, per capita output value added levels. Uh, so, so this is also, in fact, you know, if you look at our uh, uh, habitations, uh, once you take out the mega cities, uh, the very large uh, uh, urban uh, agglomerations, which of course, you know, I mean, Delhi, Bombay, Chennai, these are very large, Kolkata, these are very, very large. But once you get past those, you know, so, you know, they'll together maybe account for 15% of the population. Uh, but, but very vast number of uh, population is in very small, uh, small habitations. Uh, and that, of course, again, makes the task of bringing uh, infrastructure very, very difficult. Uh, you know, you, you uh, um, uh, 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 bring roads, you know, so we've been building rural roads since Vaj uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee. Uh, uh, the task is not complete, uh, you know, connecting every uh, uh, urban household, uh, 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 every rural kind of habitation to some urban center. Task remains incomplete after uh, at least 20 years of very, very concerted effort, large amount of resources deployed, et cetera. You want to bring in electricity, it's a difficult task. On top of that, our policies have also been anti-migration. I mean, ultimately, you know, you, you have to accept the fact that uh, economic activity, uh, productive economic activity concentrates in urban habitations. Uh, and they may start in rural habitations. I mean, I talk in terms of, you know, two ur models of urbanization. One is the Mumbai Shanghai model where, uh, you know, very large cities grow even larger and workers, it, they become magnets for the workers to migrate to. Uh, and then you've got the Shenzhen model where, uh, which is the, the China's uh, leading kind of uh, center, which in 1980 was nothing but a bunch of fishing villages with a population of only 300,000 but it became urban and today is one of the most urbanized uh, centers. Uh, 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 so one or the other way, ultimately the highly productive centers are going to be urban if uh, either they, they are urban or they will become urban. Uh, and, and that has to be facilitated, not resisted. But our policies have been very kind of generally uh, uh, trying to lock down, try to tie down the workers into rural areas. You know, every scheme that we have actually tries to keep the workers where they are. Uh, and, and that is counterproductive in the end, because uh, even today, the average output per worker uh, in industry and services is more than four times of what it is in agriculture. Uh, and, and, you know, industry and services is largely urban. And that's, you know, I mean, I'm not questioning, I have no problem with the urban versus rural, but it just happens to be that, that our, uh, industry and services are largely urban, but but issue is the urban, I mean, issue is agriculture versus industry and services. And in no successful country can you sustain, you know, if, 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 if uh, something like 45% of your workforce is in agriculture, uh, that's not a transformation. Transformation uh, inevitably, invariably, uh, uh, so far without exception, uh, amounts to bringing large part of the workforce out of in agriculture into industry and services. Without that, you, uh, you, you just can't, quite succeed, you can't quite transform. Uh, I mean, today, you know, South Korea has less than 5% of its workforce in agriculture. Uh, Australia, which I used to think actually of as a primarily kind of agricultural country has only 2% of its workforce in, in, in uh, uh, agriculture. The United States, same 2%. Uh, you know, you name, you look at any country which has achieved uh, high standards of living, uh, that, is, that is how it is. Uh, so that migration has to happen. That's a structural issue which needs to be addressed. Uh, but 
Having said that, I uh, just want to conclude by saying that, uh, uh, you know, I think we've done a tremendous job of conquering COVID. Uh, uh, I shouldn't say conquering because I still remain fearful that, you know, if we drop our guards, we'll stop wearing masks, uh, 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 don't take the, uh, you know, uh, necessary precautions. Uh, uh, this has been a very, very unpredictable uh, virus. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we had thought uh, in the, uh, around the Diwali of 2000, uh, 20 that we had conquered the virus and in February it came back and uh, in such a massive wave. Uh, so what kind of mutation can happen is not so predictable either. So it's, uh, we are in a better po position today having you know, vaccinated about 81% of the adult population and uh, uh, for one vaccine and uh, uh, about 41% has both vaccines uh, of, of adult population. So that's a very, very significant progress. But still, caution is required. You know, the uh, United States example is in front of us that uh, 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 even after so much vaccination, uh, these uh, uh, the, the infections have been and deaths have been rising again. Uh, 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 today, we've crossed, I think, something like 90,000 uh, uh, infections per day. Uh, so this has been, I mean, not only re remained kind of uh, uh, high in the range of 80,000, but in the last week or 10 days, they've again begun to rise. So one needs to be still very careful. Uh, uh, we are in better shape, better position now. And, and if we can really maintain that, uh, I, I'm very upbeat actually, you know, we'll very quickly get to seven to 8%. This year, uh, we will get to double digit growth rate. There's no doubt. You can argue, by the way, we have already, you know, in, in the second half of the fiscal year 21, we had already crossed the pre-COVID. Uh, a lot of people don't recognize this fact because the first two quarters of that, uh, uh, first two quarters of fiscal year 21, uh, there was a, a significant decline in the growth rate because first quarter was 24%, second was 7%. But third and fourth quarter, we actually saw positive growth. Uh, and those were all compared to the pre-COVID, uh, you know, the, 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 com the comparator uh, base uh, quarters were actually pre-COVID. So we had already come in. Now, Again, the first quarter of uh, 22 is not quite uh, uh, crosses the pre-COVID level, uh, but, but that's because that was quite the quarter when we got the second wave. So, in, but, and which was massive. And in spite of that, you know, out of the 24% decline in the same quarter last year, uh, we could get back to about 20%. So negative 24 was counteracted by about almost 20% growth. Uh, um, so not quite up to there. So, you know, you needed about 25% growth to cross that, uh, cross the, uh, uh, the pre-COVID level, uh, but nevertheless, very much there. So all the other indicators, G, uh, the, the GST, the export performance, the, uh, you know, Google mobility indices, et cetera, they all point to very robust recovery, the, the uh, purchasing ma managers index, uh, whatever you, uh, all of that is pointing to a very strong recovery. And, and if we actually can keep the, the, the infections where they are uh, or uh, lower them further, uh, I think we'll get back to, you know, for the next year, uh, 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 fiscal year 22, 23, the uh, International Monetary Fund itself has forecasted 8.5% for India. That's the highest uh, anywhere uh, in the world. Uh, and, and I think we'll sustain about 78% growth over the next two decades. Uh, so very good uh, uh, prospects that, you know, by 2030 for sure, we will be the third largest economy. Uh, and uh, uh, if we take the 20 year period, we ought to get to something close to 10, uh, 10 trillion, uh, which will give us a good comfortable per capita income uh, uh, to, uh, to make large parts of India relatively prosperous. So on that positive note, I'll conclude and let's then get to the question and answer. Thank you, sir, for those extremely enriching insights. We'll now move to the questions that we have for you on the topic under discussion, post which we'll take certain questions from the audience. Here to reiterate again, certain housekeeping announcements for the audience. Kindly take note that the session will be a moderated one. Hence, all attendees are invited to type out their questions in the Q&A section at all times in order to facilitate the discussion. Without further ado, we'll dive straight into the questions, sir. So, sir, my first question to you is a fairly gener generic one to start us off and, you know, one that you've already answered to some extent. But uh, the, the question would read that, what will be your take on how the Indian government responded to the pandemic? Would you say that the response was adequate and proportionate 
to the impacts of the pandemic, not only in the economic sphere, but holistically. So uh, on the economics sphere, I have no complaints, actually. It, 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 India did splendidly well. Uh, absolutely no question. You know, uh, uh, I was always of the opinion that India should not follow the US and European uh, lead of uh, massive uh, uh, transfers. Uh, and the reason was simple. Uh, I don't know why all the other governments missed this, that uh, they, they pandemic uh, was uh, a shock both to demand and supply. It was not just a demand shock. If it's just a demand shock, then you go with uh, uh, curing the demand problem. Uh, but it was also a supply shock. Uh, workers couldn't get to the workplaces. Uh, uh, different firms could not get their raw materials. They could not get their uh, components. Uh, so the, uh, uh, none of that could happen. So economic activity couldn't happen basically for uh, 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 a considerable part of that period. Uh, and particularly when the when when the pandemic was so intense, uh, and so the right thing to do was to uh, ensure that everybody has access to food, everybody has access to shelter, uh, 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 and uh, 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 then work on the supply side problems. Because without solving the supply side problems, you are not going to get the economy going. Uh, which is exactly what the government did. Uh, and uh, the, the United States and Europe, most European economies that actually in, uh, made massive transfers only ended up with uh, massive savings, which are now being spent now that you know, this, uh, the, the uh, um, basically economy has opened up. Uh, uh, now the, and, and that's not sitting into inflation. US has uh, an inflation in October of 6.2%, which is highest in 30 years. Uh, so I think no question we handled that very well. I was very much uh, on, on, on handling the pandemic itself. I was very much with the government on uh, 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 the strict lockdown we did. At the time, uncertainty was huge. Uh, we knew nothing about the uh, virus. Uh, and and uh, in a very large country like India, the, the fears were that you know, we could be facing massive deaths, uh, but that was avoided. Now, I think, you know, in, in, in uh, the second wave was was clearly uh, a, a, a failure, um, and and but one has to be careful here. I think you know uh, it, it was certainly the government's failure, but nobody else did very well either. Uh, I I think you know nobody anticipated it. The Diwali onwards, if you look at the pictures, nobody is wearing masks, and 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 massive shoulder to shoulder crowds. Uh, 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 I think policy-wise, for example, the response would have been to do something during West Bengal elections. They should have kind of, you know, tried to, to uh, wind them up faster. Something should have been done. Uh, uh, the Mela, you know, Kum Mela sh should have been, you know, handled differently. Uh, but having said that, uh, remember that the, 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 the during these months, April, uh, particularly March and April, the, the, the infections were not in these places. Infections were in Kerala, they were in Maharashtra, they were in Chhattisgarh, uh, so in very different places. So when people say this, that you know, somehow the uh, uh, government is responsible and all, I think everybody was responsible, number one. The government, being government, has greater responsibility. So, so, so uh, I think they bear greater burden of the failure. One area in which I had written, you know, if you go back, I, I'd done a podcast and then also written, End of September 2020, I was saying that, you know, invest five to seven billion dollars in vaccines today. Because I was seeing what the US was doing, you know, and, 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 and because there's nothing, five to seven billion dollars, because if, if, if the pandemic locks down your economy, you lose that in one week or maybe two weeks. I mean, the loss, so, so five to seven billion dollars was a very good investment in, into vaccines, didn't happen. Uh, January, I wrote again twice, and and I, at that time I said do five to ten billion. And trigger for me was that we had actually given approval to two vaccines at that time in January, the uh, the COVID shield, COVID shield, and co vaccine. So when you're given that kind of approval to two vaccines, every reason to go and invest immediately then about up to ten billion dollars in uh, 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 vaccines was still not done. We would have been prepared, you know, if we had done it, things could have moved a little faster. So, I mean, these are the, you know, uh, and, and 
pointing out mistakes that I not saying that it's hindsight. I mean, what this is something that I had certainly foreseen. Nobody else written, by the way, if you go look back, such a lot of people who came to criticize the government actually in April when things went out of hand. Not a single person, uh, or not a single critique actually, actually had written anything about uh, 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 investment in vaccines, for example. So, so, so a lot of this criticism actually was very ill-conceived and forced actually the government's hand to then uh, decentralize, which became another mistake. That was, you know, I mean, government got besieged at that time uh, uh, by, by all the critics, you know, none of which actually came to apologize after, or at least accepting that they were wrong. So April, somewhere mid-April, I think the government announced that, uh, mid-April 2021 announced that we will decentralize. And, and the end, before the end of that month, you know, I write once a month in the Times of India, I wrote at that time, I said, this is a mistake. This will have to be reversed because vaccine is a national public good. And, you, and, and, and coordination of vaccination at the national level is essential. And the government had already demonstrated. I think, you know, when, when it started the vaccination, it actually went extremely smoothly. I talked to my friends in at least, uh, you know, 10 different friends in four different cities. Uniformly, not a single one said that they had any difficulty. It was a very smooth process and everything. And it was nationally kind of, you know, the national portal through which it was being done. No other country had that kind of national portal. And we gave that up. Anyway, you know, at least uh, wisdom prevailed. And by May, uh, we, we reversed that and came back. And after that, of course, it has been absolutely fantastic. I mean, you know, to have vaccinated in such a large country, 81% of the adult population, at least one vaccine. And even two vaccines are 41%. That's a huge thing. So I think uh, that's my rough kind of assessment. Thank you so much, sir, for that answer. Moving on to the next question, which you also spoke of during your opening remarks. The fact that there were extensive talks about the Indian GDP rising by 20.1% in the April-June quarter, which was also notably the fastest pace since the mid-1990s, in fact. However, a much-needed insight here was the fact that the rise was observed after a stark fall of 24.4% in the same period, like you mentioned. Considering that this happened alongside the disastrous second wave, how would you say that a probable third wave, as has all already been warned by the RBI, will affect the forecast annual growth of 9.5, while the ADB also predicts a 10% growth rate? Well, so far, look, you know, the pundits were forecasting a wave in October. Uh, uniformly, those were the reports. Uh, if you go back to, you know, period before October, so on that they have proved proven wrong in the first place. So, so uh, I mean, I still want to be cautious that you know that doesn't mean the third wave is behind us. No, actually, that and the, by the way, the behavior of the people uh, again became what it was uh, during the Diwali period of uh, uh, 2020. I mean, we again there were massive crowds without masks or anything, shoulder to shoulder and all. And and you know, this virus we don't know because. Even though the mask had been dropped in uh, Diwali in 2020, uh, uh, the wave started in February, around 10th February, they began to rise. Um, so we don't know. I mean, this is an unpredictable virus uh, and, and what mutations might happen. Now, because of the vaccination, maybe mutations are less likely now, uh, but you can't rule out. So, so that, I think, you know, with that cautionary note, uh, I would say that. Uh, uh, first of all, the 20% growth uh, 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 was, after all, uh, in, uh, uh, alongside uh, a, a massive uh, COVID wave, was a very good performance, I would say. And we know that the two quarters that preceded this uh, th this 20% growth quarter were above co pre-COVID growth. So we had the second half of the, uh, fiscal year 21 that was higher than the, uh, 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 that, that already had put out uh, GDP levels that were higher than pre-COVID levels. So I think this is why I, I remain upbeat uh, and, and I've already said this before. Thank you, sir. So the next question I have is, so increased factory put output, a bullish stock market, multiple huge IPOs, decline in unemployment rate, increasing foreign investment and easing inflation are all signs of a recovering economy. And in the wake of the same, we also see a privatization push by the government through market-oriented changes, 
hoping to lure investment away from China and other countries. In the same context, then, sir, in your opinion, will the privatization frenzy be going to bear fruit for the for the country? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I've advocated that for a long, long time, and uh, all the evidence shows. You know, number of privatizations were done during Vajpayee era. And uh, uh, uniformly, those uh, 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 enterprises, once they passed on to private hands, have all done much better. Much. I mean, you know, it's not uh, a small difference. Uh, the, the difference is just uh, uh, night and day. Uh, so, look, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, uh, for enterprises to succeed, you need commercial pressure. You need the possibility uh, uh, that if you don't perform, then you perish. Uh, but, you know, when you run things on taxpayer money, there is no threat of perishing. Uh, at the same time, those who are running are uh, always worried about the vigilance agencies coming after them eventually. Uh, so these enterprises cannot run on commercial terms. And uh, no surprise, you know, we had uh, a, 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 a sad, sorry, and sordid episode like Air India, where the taxpayer was uh, uh, left uh, uh, high and dry uh, uh, with the billions and billions of dollars worth of uh, debt. That, that the taxpayer will have to now foot. Uh, so, so this is very important. Uh, unfortunately, privatization has not progressed very well. Uh, I mean, Air India is the only one final success that we can um, count. But uh, I had started the process myself, actually, when at Niti Ayog in 2016. Uh, and Prime Minister uh, was always with it. Uh, he had, without his blessing, of course, the Niti Ayog couldn't have pro uh, proceeded further. Uh, we, we, we had given out list after list, cabinet had uh, cleared them, uh, but in the end, uh, uh, the, uh, our processes are really awful, actually, I must say, you know, I mean, even uh, today's Times of India, look up, you know, the, there was a privatization done under Prime Minister Vajpayee in 2020, 2002, which was already investigated by the CBI, and now the Supreme Court says that, no, 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 your investigation is not good enough, so it has to be investigated yet more. I mean, what is bloody? I mean, what here? You know, in, in the end, uh, 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 the, the the courts are getting into all kind of economic issues, well beyond their either their mandate or their expertise, and so that is a serious problem in in the current system as well. So that, of course, then scares away the uh, uh, bureaucrats who have to undertake the privatization, right? I mean, if they feel that, look, you know. Uh, there is uh, no statute of limitation on these things. And uh, I do privatization today. And I, uh, when I'm 80 years old, uh, uh, they will come with some investigative report against me uh, and threaten me with putting me in jail. You know, so they say, well, yeah, I'm in my last two years. The senior most bureaucrat usually in the last two years of his retirement. So why do it? You bide your time and retire. Let the hot potato be passed on to the next person. So the system, the the, 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 the the systems have not helped in this process, unfortunately. Uh, that is a sad thing. I mean, you know, the fixing that that part of the system is not an easy task. But you know, ultimately we'll have to face that, uh, you know, uh, or at least start closing down the non-performing uh, um, uh, public sector enterprises, so that eventually, and not keep putting more and more money into new public sector enterprises. I mean, you know, if we put a stop to that. Uh, that itself will help actually, you know, ultimately that proportionately the activity share of the private sector will continue to rise. All right, sir. I'll just take one last question and then we'll take questions from the Q&A box. So, uh, so a flood of unicorns and strong IPOs in the pipeline over the next two years, uh, how do you think India's market capitalization is expected to rise, enabled by the rise of the internet ecosystem, availability of private capital, and favorable regulatory environment? Look, you know, if I knew, if I could predict that, then I, I, why would I be giving this lecture? You know, I would just <laughs> do what uh, Junjunuwala is doing. <laughs> So, uh, I, I mean, I, I, all I can say is the economic prospects, I, I see them as being very good. And therefore, uh, uh, in general, uh, an investor who, uh, you know, chooses a reasonable, smart portfolio is not going to regret it uh, because the prospects for the economy uh, over, over it. I mean, I'm talking longer period, you know, if you're doing for short periods, then uh, of course, you know, the, anything can happen in short periods. But if you 
are doing this for a long-term investment, um, I, I don't think you can lose out by investing in the Indian economy. Uh, have a diversified portfolio and uh, and uh, stay there for a for a while. Stay there for a while, you know. Uh, they it, because the prospects for the economy are very good. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I'll move to questions from the Q and A section. Saranj Pudar asks, um, so which one of the two do you think is better, bilateral FTAs or multilateral trade pacts from the point of view of the Indian economy? Look, you know, multilateral will always be better, uh, 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 you know, if we can really liberalize uh, uh, on, uh, on our own, knock down the tariffs. Um, uh, uh, there's nothing comparable to that. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that uh, in the current um, environment, it doesn't seem to be happening. And so I have tried to put my weight behind the FTAs. Uh, that at least let's do that if we can't, you know, if, if you are not going to do the the uh, liberalization. I mean, I don't want to call you, you know, multilateral. What I mean is non-discriminatory. You knock down tariffs against everybody rather than uh, uh, selectively against your FTA partners. I think that will be the first best thing to do. Uh, but but uh, if we are not going to do that, then at least let's sign FTAs. Yes, sir. The next question is by Hardik Sharma. He asks, what is the way forward for reforms in agriculture now when the three farm laws have been repealed? What can be a better strategy for government to bring about these quintessential reforms in the future? Uh, I'm sorry, Hardik. You know, for a while, I think uh, we are set back on that front. Um, uh, very unfortunate indeed. Uh, but uh, uh, these marketing reforms were really very, very important reforms. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, given what the baggage now that, that, that has been created, uh, you know, setback is bigger than, it may, than, than just the farm laws themselves, because uh, uh, remember that uh, for 17 years, many of these reforms had been tried at the state level. You know, the uh, agricultural marketing is a state level issue. Um, and uh, 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 it, state APMC laws, the, the Agricultural Produce Marketing Committees Act, uh, these were being reformed. Uh, uh, some, many of the provisions uh, uh, had been enacted, of, of these three laws had been enacted, two actually, not the three, third one is a different one. Uh, of the two laws uh, uh, were enacted under the state reforms uh, earlier. Uh, and that was the process going on. So even that process now gets set back, I think, you know, because uh, states will become more cautious. Uh, and it has strengthened the hand of the intermediaries, the RTAs, uh, effectively, you know, the commission agents at the uh, uh, APMC uh, markets. So, so that's a setback. I would say that let's then work on other fronts. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are issues of electricity, issues of water, uh, issues of uh, uh, crop diversification, uh, uh, perhaps, you know, what I, I would see it, for example, you know, another thing we can do is uh, bring in the, the uh, GMO seeds, you know, why are we uh, not uh, 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 allowing the GMO seeds? Uh, I mean, you know, in the US, I've been consuming this for 30 years now, uh, I've had no adverse effects. Uh, uh, in co cotton, we have already had, and anyway, some of the stuff we are importing actually does carry the, uh, you know, some of the oil seeds, etc. Uh, they they carry the GMO impact, so so that's another area where uh, one can do. Uh, and I think most important, I've always felt in any case, that the best thing you can do actually uh, for the farmers is to create jobs in industry and services have them migrate, you know, go and talk to the, the children of the farmers. There are surveys uh, out there, you know. Uh, uh, most of those children are, are not keen on becoming farmers. They want to do other things. They want to do, take education, get education. They want to be in the cities and all. So if we actually create uh, 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 good jobs for in, uh, in industry and services, uh, I think that you that is the best thing we will ever do for the farmers. I mean, frankly, look, uh, I don't think we could have solved the 
poverty problem of the farmers or, or not poverty, but certainly low prosperity problem of the farmers through even these farm laws. Uh, because uh, the, the, the average value added in these farms is so low that even if you double or triple it, it's not a very large number. It's not a very big number. Remember that, as I said, you know, industry and services average work, uh, output per worker is already four times that in agriculture. So you do not even, even when you triple it, you are not bringing them even to the current level of industry and services. So ultimately, I think salvation for the, for, for the farmers, particularly these farmers who are working on uh, uh, the bottom half of the farms, which are less than half hectare uh, in size, uh, uh, ultimate salvation is by creating jobs in industry and services. So that's where the other reforms are very important and, and, and don't you know, have this mindset of, uh, uh, oh, the farmer should stay in the rural areas, don't, don't come to the urban areas because the life in slums is so bad. Well, if life in slums is so bad, improve the life in slums instead of you know, investing money in, uh, uh, in owner occupied housing, create a low rental housing to which migrants come in, in which migrants come in, can come in and stay. And, and you know something like dormitory kind of housing because most migrants want to come for even uh, temporarily six to eight months, maybe six months or so, earn a lot of money and go back to the villages. At least, some, at least initially, this is how the process begins. And, and so give them low rental housing. You know, what is the point of investing so much into owner occupied uh, housing you know, the, in terms of the transfers create? And that of course requires, by the way, we didn't touch on it, massive land reforms, meaning, uh, land is damn expensive in, in India, and that is a policy, uh, that's a problem created by policy largely, uh, that needs to be solved. Uh, 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 solve that, that will bring in even commercial rental housing. See, right now, the problem is that we, land being so expensive, the commercial rental yields are too low. Uh, you know, you get 2% or something, but the interest rate itself on the money you'll borrow from bank to create commercial housing would require eight, nine, at least 9, 10%. So unless the yields are about 11, 12% on rental yields are 11, 12%, you can't, uh, uh, commercial rental is not viable. So ultimately it goes to the land prices and then something needs to be done there. So since we're speaking of rural urban migration here, the migrant crisis during the first lockdown impacted the informal sector badly. How will the government plug in economic laws from this time? Well, you know, look, uh, this, this was a major shock external to, about which nobody could have done anything. Uh, it, it was an external shock. Uh, and uh, um, uh, everybody suffered. Actually, it's not like uh, uh, only migrants suffered. Migrants suffered a lot more. There's no question about that. But that was a period of uh, suffering. But my sense is that, look, you know, uh, ultimately, uh, uh, nature of migrants is to, you know, uh, uh, come where the opportunities are. And uh, if they find that, you know, they don't have much to do where they have migrated to, then nature is also to return. I mean, you know, in, in a very different context, I came to Princeton to do my PhD. And when summer came, if I had enough money, my nature was, I want to go home uh, because now I got two or three months free. Uh, and, and so we witnessed that phenomenon that the moment the economy closed down, they said, well, I've got nothing to do here. So people in, and even undertook to walk uh, uh, hundreds of miles to get to their homes. Um, uh, but that's a temporary issue. Let's solve the, you know, the, the, the COVID is going behind us. And, Migrants are already returning, you know, I mean, uh, and, and uh, more and more will return. Uh, the, the, the point is to what I said, create favorable conditions for migrants uh, to be able to find, you know, they don't ask for much. I mean, I came to the United States with $200 or less in, in my pocket. And in the end, you know, you rough it out wherever, whichever way you, uh, you can, and you try to survive. Uh, because you're ambitious, you know, migrants are generally younger people. Uh, and at that age, uh, you are willing to take risks. Uh, I mean, I couldn't do it what I did uh, uh, 45 years ago or, or almost 50 years ago. I couldn't do it today. Uh, but uh, I could do it at that age. Uh, your, your, your limited responsibilities, you are ambitious, you want to do something. Uh, and, and that's the migrant. Uh, 
uh, uh, so with only small help uh, and, and facilitation, I think we can really make a big difference. Thank you so much, sir, for answering that. Uh, so since we're since it's time, um, and if you want, I mean, uh, if you still have time for us, if you can spare some more minutes, we can take take up other questions. If not, we can conclude the session. I can do another five minutes, but uh, you know, have have another thing, another engagement after. Sure, so. sir. We completely understand. All right then, sir. I'll take the last question. Pratul asks: Should India leave? the World Trade Organization and focus instead on the regional economic groups and bilateral economic the and bilateral economy groups. Absolutely not. No, no, absolutely not. The World Trade Organization membership is crucial. Uh, 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 you should understand that that the day you leave World Trade Organization, all the other countries who are members of the WTO can raise their tariffs left, right, center, whichever they want. Uh, you, you, you know, then they have no obligation to extend to you what is called the MFN tariff to, you know, th that, that uh, the obligation under the WTO is that every country extends the same treatment to everybody else. Only exceptions are within the free trade agreements. Uh, um, uh, and and uh, if you are not a member of the WTO, uh, uh, then tariffs can be raised against you by all these WTO members, uh, you know, they don't have to extend their most favored tariff uh, to you. So you absolutely, we absolutely cannot afford to be out of the WTO. Uh, but we should certainly, as we have discussed already, you know, go and try to sign more free trade agreements uh, with the European Union, with the United Kingdom, Canada, uh, Australia, um, you know, these are major trading partners. Uh, because, you know, I would have also liked us to be in RCEP, but after what happened in Galwan Valley, I changed my mind. Uh, and I think, you know, that in particularly now, give, for the geopolitical reasons, our objective is also to uh, move the economic uh, engagement away from China. How do you do that? Well, the only sensible way to do it is to make it more profitable to trade with other countries, other entities, European Union, United Kingdom, United States. So that's what we ought to do. Thank you so much, sir, for answering all our questions with utmost patience. We at the Economic Society, Sri Ram College of Commerce, are immensely grateful to you for taking time out from your busy schedule to join us today. Your refined perspective exposed us to newer ideas that are fibrable to our group as students. We are once again extremely grateful to you for gracing the event with your benign presence. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mathalie. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. <laughs>